What if I told you that tea was more than just a beverage, but to some people, a way of life? In this short series, we will be taking you on a journey to meet the men and women who have built their lives around this magical plant. We will sit down with each one of them and hear their story. We will learn why they got into tea, what drives them, and what they believe the future has in store. We travel all across Japan to tell the untold story of this iconic industry. We will make many new friends along the way and learn more about how to properly cultivate and prepare the drink known as tea. We will also explore the natural beauty of this wonderful country and see the different steps farmers take to coexist with nature. These farmers believe that using organic methods of farming is the best way to form a healthy relationship between their tea fields and the natural world. First, we head off to Tokyo to get a glimpse of some world class tea rooms. We learn from certified tea masters how to prepare the perfect cup of tea. We also learn a bit about traditional sweets consumed during the tea ceremony. Next, we head to the South Island of Kyushu and really get to see a part of Japan rarely seen by tourists. We visit small family farms in the countryside and learn from farmers that have been growing tea for generations. We then take a boat ride to the island of Yakushima, a place famous for its natural beauty. We learn even more about the importance of coexisting with nature and the deep level of respect they have for the natural world. We then go out to Shizuoka and explore Japan's largest tea producing region. We learn how tea cultivation can be not only a family run operation, but a big business as well. We continue on our quest to find the best organic matcha. Hojicha, Gyokuro, and Sencha in Japan. The tea farmers are some of the kindest people we have ever met. The only request they made from us is to tell their story. They want the world to know the importance of preserving nature and the level of care that goes into producing some of the world's best tea. Our journey begins in the bustling city of Tokyo. Now the largest metropolitan area in the world, Tokyo is famous for its clashing of both new and old. Here you can see centuries old shrines and temples located merely a few blocks away from skyscrapers and bright city lights. It's also home to many amazing tea shops. We wanted to start our trip off right by first tasting some of the best teas Japan has to offer. We had heard of a really good tea house called Sakurai Tea Salon that has a fantastic selection of teas and a few certified tea masters that prepare them. During a full tasting, you can taste five different teas Gyokuro, Hojicha, Wakocha, Bancha, and Matcha. You are also served a variety of Wagashi, or Japanese sweets, in between tea tastings. We signed up for two tea tastings, and for the next two hours, we did nothing but drink tea. First on our list was the Gyokuro. This is known as the highest quality green tea in Japan and used to be the tea of choice for the emperor. This tea is shaded for up to 21 days, and during that time, the tea produces more chlorophyll and theanine. This yields a flavor that is very sweet and savory. The texture also becomes thicker, and typically, Gyokuro is enjoyed in very small amounts. The smaller the amount of Gyokuro, the more the taste and the texture can be savored. Here, they took that concept to the extreme and used an extremely small amount of water for the tasting. The tea master then used an hourglass to count out three minutes before pouring us the tea. The tea was incredibly sweet and delicious, and although I only had an amount the size of a thimble, I made it last for many, many sips and enjoyed it throughout the next few minutes. Another benefit of using a small amount of water is that there was still plenty of flavor in the second and third steepings of this tea. For the fourth steeping, the tea master combined the leaves with pickled sakura blossom to make a beautiful cold brew. The sweet gyokuro combined beautifully with the tart sakura blossom to create a seasonal drink unlike any other. We also got to eat the leaves of the gyokuro afterwards. You can add a tiny bit of vinegar or soy sauce to the leaves of this green tea, and it ends up tasting like a delicious salad. After tasting the Gyokuro, 
we moved on to the next tea on our list, hojicha. Hojicha is a roasted green tea that is very popular in Japan. Today, we would get the opportunity to pick out which tea we wanted, and then the tea master would roast it right in front of us. We browsed the selection of six green teas from various regions throughout Japan and selected two we liked. The tea master then took out a special type of pan used for hand roasting hojicha. She roasted the leaves over a small flame and then poured them out into the teapot. Once the hojicha was ready, we got to drink it alongside some pickled ginger root, an excellent food pairing to this unique tea. After drinking two very different hojichas, we headed on to our next tea course, the wakocha. Wakocha is the Japanese word for black tea, and although this is far less common than green tea, it is still enjoyed in Japan. So this is black tea? Mm. Very smooth. What I realized a little bit about the Japanese is there's a strong caramel note, note always with the, with the black tea from Japan. Often when you like a black tea from other regions, there's much more sweetness into it. Here you often have this typical caramel note coming from the black tea. After the black tea, we moved into our bancha tasting. Just like with the hojicha, we got to choose which tea we wanted to try from a few different options. While most teas are made from the young tea leaves, bancha is made from the older parts of the plant. Here you will often see stems and larger leaves. The one with the thickest stems is known as sonin bancha. Here we got an opportunity to try some very unique teas, although the thing we were really looking forward to was the matcha tasting at the end. Matcha is a type of green tea that is made by grinding tea leaves into a very fine powder. Only the best leaves are used to make matcha, and they also have their stems and veins removed before being ground, which only enhances their flavor even further. This is the tea that is traditionally consumed during the Japanese tea ceremony. The tea is first sifted into a bowl called a chawan and then carefully whisked into warm water using a bamboo whisk called a chasen. The goal is to create lots of foam in the tea which aerates the tea and makes it smoother and creamier. The tea masters have perfected this art and the end result is a tea that tastes almost like a latte but with no cream or sugar. Tasting all of these teas was a great way to become acquainted with the different types of teas in Japan and discuss which ones we would be searching for on our sourcing trip. With our tea tasting finished, we headed off to Yoyogi Park to enjoy the cherry blossoms. During the few short weeks when the cherry blossoms are in bloom, tourists and locals alike gather underneath these trees and enjoy time with friends. This is known as hanami, which is basically just enjoying being outside during the cherry blossom season with friends and family. The next day, we would be visiting a second tea shop for another incredible tasting. In the heart of Ginza, there exists a small tea shop by the name Higashiya. At this tea shop, certified tea masters prepare some of the finest green tea in Japan. It was here that you could really see how varied the world of Japanese tea is. Depending on the shape of the leaves, the shading of the leaves, and the part of the plant used to make tea, it can take on a vast array of different forms. Here you can see that no two teas are really the same. We decided we wanted to try three entirely new teas, so we first started with karigane. This is a shaded stem tea made from the leaves and stems of tencha or gyokoro, the two most prized green teas in Japan. The tea usually has a delicate sweetness to it, made more mild by the inclusion of the stems. Next we tried Fukumushicha, a deep steamed sencha. Normally, Japanese green tea is steamed for about 45 to 90 seconds after being harvested. The Fukumushicha is steamed for 90 to 120 seconds. This longer steaming removes some of the bitter components of the tea, rendering it sweeter and smoother. The color also becomes a very vibrant green. Finally, we tried our personal favorite, the Kabusecha. This is a high quality shaded sencha and it was the sweetest tea they had. So this tea here has a really uh, sweet, strong floral note, that's what he said us, said us when he served the tea. 
it's really that the, that's the most sweet tea they have. What's interesting in comparison, for example, to the Kyokuro, where you have a lot of this savory note, here you have a light, small, fine astringency, so a delicate astringency, you might say, which is developing a little bit in the mouth, but it's so strong in the floral note, which is quite impressive. So. Towards the end of the tasting, we got to enjoy some new agashi that was very different from what we had at Sakurai. After the tea tasting, we decided to enjoy our last few hours in Tokyo. Soon, we would be embarking on a journey through the south of Japan to visit small organic farmers in the countryside. Although it would be sad to leave this wonderful city behind, we knew we had the adventure of a lifetime waiting for us. Far beyond the bustling streets of Tokyo lies the peaceful southern island of Kyushu. Many small tea farmers call this island home and we knew there was so much we could learn from them. Here, the pace of life is a bit slower, the culture is more traditional, and of course, the tea is just incredible. It is here that we get to see a part of Japan rarely seen by tourists. Please join us on our journey through the countryside of Japan. Hello everyone, so we are here at the Narita airport and we had already on our travel the first hiccups. We brought from Europe some beautiful liquor and uh, we were allowed to check them in, in the airplane, but apparently you cannot take more than 50 kilos, so we had to change this in another suitcase and then uh, we had another problem that one suitcase was 10, two centimeters too big and this was also not allowed so uh, we had to check in two bags instead of one and now we are flying to the south and they already informed us that it might be that we're not landing at the right airport so we are wondering where we will end up but we will end up in the south and we are looking forward to it despite the weather concerns we were able to make it safely to our destination in kagoshima and begin our journey on the right foot that's a very fine green tea directly from Kyoto. It's actually my first bottle of green tea here in Japan. In Tokyo, I never drank one. So here's now the first which I have. And it's a very nice liqueur. Very tasty, cold, refreshing green tea. Welcome to Kagoshima. They had a complimentary foot bath outside the airport. And after a long flight, I wanted to get in on the action. Although this was fun, we couldn't sit around too long. We had things to do. First, we needed to rent a car. Eager to save money, Oliver carefully inspected the vehicle to ensure there were no scratches that weren't accounted for. So here's a scratch. Here are three scratches. Here a little bit. He says if it's, they're so small, it's no problem. It took everyone a little while to get used to driving on the left side of the road, but soon we were on our way to our first destination. <laughs> Stars are good. Only a three minute ride from Kagoshima Airport is an amazing tea shop with their own tea field in the backyard. Here they harvest the tea, process it, and serve it all in the same place. We are really excited about trying a few of these special teas. Well, wow, but it has a very fruity note already in the nose. What is what you have here is actually the same cultivar, so it's twice the same cultivar. One is just organic, and uh, the other one is non-organic. And it seems nearly that the uh, non-organic one has been shaded a little bit longer, um, but. The main difference comes out in the smell, so it's both a asamushi, so a shortly steamed tea, and here you have much more sweetness, which is coming out. After a nice tea tasting, we headed to our hotel in Kagoshima. The car ride was about half an hour. To entertain ourselves, we decided to see what was playing on the local radio stations. Let's do some music. 
使うことも増えてきたそうですね実際にあのしかも今回の開園によって。After only five minutes at the hotel, we already felt spoiled by the generous hospitality of southern Japan. So we are in our hotel, and、uh, as you can see, a very a beautiful setting. Very welcoming. We even have a small origami. I would say this is a swan. My imagination says it is a swan. We have our own bathrobe. Very, very good. So, perfect time in the morning then when we get up. And the most important, we have our own personal. After a late night of tea drinking, we got into the car and started to make our way through the mountains to visit the first farmer on our list. Henta Secha was a family run tea field specializing in organic green tea. We talked with Mr. Henta for over an hour and learned so much about green tea. He explained that tea leaves get their nutrients from the stems, so he looks at the thickness of the stems to determine the quality. The thicker the stems of the tea leaves, the more nutrients they are able to deliver to the tea leaves. It is this attention to detail that makes the tea from Henta Secha so incredible. We had the opportunity to test a few of these teas before heading out into the field. So, this is a Samidori、um, Fukamushi Sencha. So, you can see the color is beautifully jade green. Typical. It's a very light, very sweet in taste. A small astringency to it in the end, bringing a little bit of freshness. But very, very good. Now we go to the Okumidori. Okumidori. So, difference already. It's much lighter and.、Uh, This shows much more sweetness in the nose already. I already had it、uh, with the leaves when I smelt the leaves. It's a really, really good c o l t i v a r d o k o m i d o r i for me.、Mm. I like it, the sweetness of it is very beautiful compared to the Samidori. Samidori is kind of finer. It's not so strong in sweetness. d o k u m i d o r i is much more round and smoother, but it doesn't show so much, so much、uh, of the grassiness in the end, which I feel that I have more with the.、Uh, with the Samidori. It had rained just a few hours prior to our visit, so the sky was gray, the earth was wet, and there was a beautiful smell to the air. After a ton of traveling in the past few days, it was really nice to be surrounded by the forests and mountains of this region. This field tour was a great opportunity for us to learn more about cultivars. A cultivar is a subspecies of the tea plant with unique characteristics. Just like different types of grapes produce different wines, different types of tea leaves produce different teas. The most popular cultivar in Japan is the Yabukita. Making up about 70% of the total production. If you are looking to produce a smoother tea like a matcha, you might use a cultivar called Okomidori, which is known for its nice round flavor. If you want to strengthen the umami note of your tea, you can use the Goku cultivar, known for its bold flavor. There are more premium cultivars to get that delicate sweet flavor, one of which is known as Saimidori. All of these different types of teas were on display here, and we could see just how different they were. Some have thick leaves, some have thin leaves, some are round and others are long and skinny. Some were already producing buds, and others still had a few weeks to go. It was here that we realized just how complicated of a science tea farming can be. 
Another important distinction between cultivars is bud density. Certain cultivars may have 100 buds in a certain area, while others may have only half that. The buds can also reach different heights, producing different quantities of tea. While it usually ends up evening out, this is something tea farmers need to consider when it comes to estimating the future yields of the tea crop. After a successful tea farm visit, we headed back on the road to travel to Shibushi, a small town just east of Kagoshima. Right in the middle of a rice field sat a beautiful ryokan run by an older couple. A ryokan is a traditional Japanese inn with tatami mats and sliding doors. They also almost always have proper tea brewing equipment, so we decided to do a short tea tasting and explain everything we had learned during our recent visit. After a few pots of tea, we decided to call it a night. In the morning, we would be visiting a new tea field and embarking on an entirely new adventure. Gyokuro is known as the highest quality green tea in Japan and it is grown by one of the country's most talented farmers. Mr. Sakamoto is the president of the Kagoshima Prefecture Tea Production Association. He is a talented artist with a great appreciation for natural beauty. He is also passionate about researching the benefits organic farming can have on human and planetary health. Let's take a short look at who he is and what goes into making the so-called Emperor's Tea. When you first meet Mr. Sakamoto, it is difficult to not be impressed by him. Not only is he an incredible tea farmer, he is an incredible person as well. In his office are some beautiful paintings done by him. These were designed during his past life as an artist, but one painting stands out. Sakamoto explains this painting was made for his niece during her battle with cancer. It is hard not to be emotional when looking into her eyes. Strong, beautiful, ready to do battle. Sakamoto explains that his family has a history with cancer and disease, and he believes the chemicals used in tea cultivation were partly to blame. The tea farm has been in his family for generations, and he decided to be the one to turn it completely organic. He explained to us that while most farmers only take nutrients from the soil, he wanted to give nutrients back as well. Nowadays, the food we eat has a fraction of the nutrients it once did. We have robbed the soil of most of its nutrients, and until we restore it, we will continue to get sicker and sicker, and our food will not be able to remedy us. The question is then, how do we return nutrients to the soil? This is a question Mr. Sakamoto asked himself when he decided to start farming organically. The key, he said, may lie in sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock forms as a result of millions of years of buildup on the ocean floor. As a result, the sedimentary rock that is so common in this region is a reservoir of nutrients just waiting to be tapped. In order to activate it, he adds a mix of organic materials to the fertilizer, a process known as Bokashi fertilization. His organic fertilizer is so effective, now other farmers purchase it from him for use in their own fields. The fertilizer not only gives the tea more nutrients, it also changes the entire structure of the plant. The cellular density of his tea plants are much higher than that of a normal tea plant. There is a scientific explanation for this, but you can see it pretty clearly just by looking at these two plants. The non-organic plant starts to lose its leaf after just one week, whereas the organically fertilized plant stays strong for over two weeks. This is especially important when it comes to the production of gyokuro. Gyokuro in particular is extremely difficult to grow organically. The reason is you need to keep the tea plant alive for 21 days without proper sunlight in order to get the trademark sweet umami flavor. The plants need to be super strong to survive like this, so Mr. Sakamoto's organic fertilizer is crucial. Without this organic fertilizer, the tea plants begin to ferment and that is why most organic gyokuro does not quite meet the standards of many others. This brings up an interesting point and is actually how gyokuro became known as the emperor's tea. Many years ago, tea was only consumed by the upper class and of course the emperors always demanded the highest quality of tea. 
Before the use of refrigeration, the quality of tea was determined by how long it lasted. Because Gyokuro is one of the only green teas that actually improves with age, this was always the emperor's favorite. I'm sure the emperors would be quite impressed by the Gyokuro that Mr. Sakamoto has created today. This rigorous inspection of tea still lives on. Mr. Sakamoto explained that they now have a special way to judge the quality of a Gyokuro. They boil water, add it to the leaves, and let it sit for one hour. Although this may seem like an easy way to brew the world's worst cup of Gyokuro, they are actually stress testing the tea to see if it shows any bitterness. The best green tea in Japan should show no bitterness even when boiled. As a result, the best Gyokuro are then sold on the market for a premium and the lower quality ones are sold at a fraction of the price. To really experience the true power of Mr. Sakamoto's unique farming methods, you have to taste the tea for yourself. To this day, the Gyokuro produced by Mr. Sakamoto is among our most popular and it is easy to see why. There is a beautiful umami flavor and absolutely no bitterness. It is rare to find this level of flavor in an organic tea. The Gyokuro is also incredible when served cold, something we experienced firsthand when we first met Sakamoto. He prepared a cold pitcher of Gyokuro as well as karagane, a high quality stem tea. He also served us some wagashi or traditional Japanese sweets. Because it was Sakura season, we ate a special type of daifuki wrapped in a cherry blossom leaf. This was an excellent compliment to the beautifully sweet Gyokuro we were enjoying. But Gyokuro isn't the only tea that Mr. Sakamoto produces. He also produces an organic matcha as well. This is a type of powdered tea that is quite labor intensive. The tea leaves have to be shaded to bring out the sweetness and the umami flavor and then the leaves get their stems and veins removed to maximize the sweetness even further. The leaves are then placed in a stone mill and ground into a fine powder. To prepare the tea, you whisk it into a bowl with a bamboo whisk or cha sen. This is the type of tea served during the famous Japanese tea ceremony. With four hectares of tea plants, Sakamoto is one of the smallest tea farms we visit, but he uses his space in very innovative ways. He sets up a bamboo scaffolding around a section of tea plants which will be shaded prior to the harvest. The reason this scaffolding is important is because the younger tea plants can't support the weight of the netting when placed directly on top of them. It also provides a nice space for people to do hand picking later on in the season. Perhaps most innovative is this new row of tea plants. The prefecture of Kagoshima asked him to cultivate a brand new strain of tea not yet known to science. He crossbred different tea plants and created this entirely new species, or cultivar. When asked what the tea tastes like, he said that we won't find out until it is harvested. Sakamoto is so experienced in tea cultivation, he can tell the quality of a tea plant just by biting the leaves. He said there are also three main ways you can tell a tea leaf is not organic. You can taste the leaves and you will find an unpleasant taste almost immediately. He also said that because the cellular structure is much less dense, the tea leaves cannot support their own weight and begin to fold. You can also hold it up to the light and see if it is see-through. That also means the cellular structure is not dense enough. As we could tell by his presentation, soil is also very important to Mr. Sakamoto. He demonstrates that the looser the soil, the better it is for tea cultivation. This bamboo pole can easily slide through the soil because it is so loose. The reason for this is because the organic fertilizer he uses provides the ideal environment for earthworms and other species of flora and fauna to help break down the soil and keep it healthy. After touring the fields, Mr. Sakamoto took us to one of his favorite spots to watch the cherry blossoms, which were now in full bloom. It was here that you could see the level of appreciation he had for nature particularly the nature in his region of Shibushi. The cherry blossoms are a symbol of the fragility of life. They bloom for just a few weeks a year, and then they are gone. So too is the natural world both beautiful and fragile. If we wish to preserve nature so that it is beautiful, not just temporarily, but permanently, then we must make sure that the way we farm reflects our values. The production of our most popular beverage should be in line with the laws of nature. 
Mr. Sakamoto shared his message with us beautifully, and in the end, he asked us to share it with the world. He sees hope in the younger generation to carry on his legacy. He wants the world to not only embrace the idea of more natural farming, but to get excited about it. We have become detached from how our food and tea is produced, and by enjoying things closer to their natural state, we create a healthier relationship between us and the natural world. Getting to experience tea firsthand has been an amazing journey for us, and it is an incredible opportunity to get to share that experience with you. In the next episode, we will be discovering a new type of tea produced up in the mountains. While most Japanese green tea is steamed after being picked, the farmers at Isin-en place the tea over a hot flame and then turn it in a pan to produce a tea unlike any other. Kamairicha, as it's called, is a very unique type of Japanese green tea that is grown up in these mountains. We sit down with Mr. Isin and his family to learn more about the cultivation of this special type of tea. Visiting the farm of Isin-en was an incredible experience for all of us. Of all the farms we visited, this was perhaps the most traditional. This property is where Mr. Isin grew up. Their family's home is still around today, over 200 years old. Within its walls lie relics of a simpler time. Some of the doors inside the house are made out of a single piece of wood carved perfectly from a large tree. You can still see the designs of dragons etched into the old wood. You can also find samurai weapons throughout the house. The surrounding corridors of the house are outfitted with special floorboards. These are designed to creak when a ninja is approaching. You could see the manufacturing of bamboo utensils right here in the home. The family also sun-dried seeds and vegetables for use in their cooking. After briefly meeting this incredible family, we headed off into the fields. Isinen still uses a type of terrace farming that has become less common. It is difficult to make the climb up into the mountains every day to tend the fields, so many farmers have strayed away from this traditional method of farming. Mr. Isin simply used a pickup truck. Driving up into the mountains to see the tea fields, you were really able to notice how rough the terrain was. We were a long way from some of the more manicured tea fields. We were now really deep in the countryside. Gazing far out into the distance, you really got a sense for the natural beauty of this region. Although the rows of tea plants were going in all sorts of different directions, you couldn't help but think it was perfect. This is one of the things we love about organic farming. You may not get these perfectly straight rows, but there is something beautiful about it nonetheless. Being an organic farmer, of course Mr. Isin was also very careful about the fertilizer he put on his crops. He produced his own style of fertilizer in a very unique way. During the production of rice, there is a large part of the grain that is discarded called the hull. These hulls are the perfect ingredient for organic fertilizer and Mr. Isin produces this at scale. He showed us a large section of his organic fertilizer and when he turned it over with his truck, it began to steam. Once you get underneath the top layer of this mass, the composting begins to take place. This process generates a lot of heat as the bacteria breaks down various ingredients into a type of nutrient-dense soil. Mr. Isin also supplements his production of fertilizer with a type that he buys from another farm. He is very picky when it comes to this selection of fertilizer. He has a long list of ingredients that he does not accept. The fertilizer that he does choose is so clean that even the chickens around the farm seem to like it. He's the boss. Apparently a little bit too much. Yeah, I got already two. And if I close it, you pick my book. Yeah. <laughs> Hello everybody, we are here at the Isien Kamaidicha production. So what we will do now is just walk you through, through the whole production. So follow me. So first step, most important step of the Kamaidicha production is actually the um, Kamaidicha oven. So this is the most important part here. When the leaves uh, arrive, um, they are uh, put first through the containers there, which you can see there, over there, and then they just put up here um, over this part in the machine here on the right, and then coming slowly but surely into the oven. 
falling down here and then coming in this part here where actually the oven is heated up to 350 degrees Celsius and uh, you got a tube inside where the leaf they just turned with this tube and the matter really gets to 350 degrees up. Then in a second step they get through this tube uh, to the upper part. The upper part here is then again 200 degrees hot and um, they have kind of a second slightly slight roasting of the leaves always turned still containing um, uh, a lot of moisture but getting really um, here slightly roasted in this part and then coming into the next steps. The next steps they are mainly made through the through turning of the leaves different kinds of turning once it's rolling once in this, this uh, brush turning as well and with each step the noise gets more and more out of the, um, of the leaves and with each step uh, the leaves get drier and drier. So here we are maybe around 20% of moist still in the leaves. So to just show you how it looks inside. So um, here really uh, the leaves are pushed against the wood so they lose with each turn more and more of its moisture. Second part of um, heating um, here the oven is only around 150 degrees hot and again you can see there are uh, stones with the flame so these are small ovens giving a, again this slightly roasted flavor of the kamaericha and this is really the last part where you also have the separation of Hochicha, so Hochicha is really roasted tea, or the Kamaericha, which is slightly roasted tea. So, when I just open this here up. So this is actually a pan, um, which is heated up to around 100 degrees when it is open, 112 degrees when it is closed, and here the, the leaves stay in just for one hour, and this gives it the final, um, the final touch of this slightly roasted uh, taste and uh, when you want to do hochicha you just go up to 140 degrees and then you're gonna get this dark roasted and nearly chocolatey flavor then out of the hochicha and these then give the two different teas Mega. After touring the field where they make the hojicha and kamairicha, we got back in the truck to visit some of their other fields. The farmers have four different fields spread all throughout this small town, and it seems like all of them have this beautiful mountain view. The first field we saw was a yabukita field, the most common variety of tea in Japan. Here you could see multiple rows of tea plants at different elevations. Because these plants all belong to the same cultivar, they would all be harvested at the same time. To get to the final field, we had to drive far up into the mountains and then continue along a bumpy road through the forest. Although this road was quite treacherous, the farmer had driven it so many times he felt comfortable speeding right through it. For us, it was a bit of a traumatic experience. Although the ride was pretty frightening, the views were totally worth it. We were surrounded by huge mountains, pristine forests, and gorgeous cherry blossoms. We also got to see a very young tea field just beginning to grow. This means that the organic tea fields of Isinen are expanding, and soon more tea in this region will be produced organically. This really gives us hope for the future. You could see the trademark fertilizer of Mr. Isin in the soil, clearly a sign that these young plants will be given an excellent head start. Soon, they will be strong, healthy plants and go on to produce some of the world's best tea. The island of Yakushima truly is a spectacle to behold. Located in the far south of Japan, this small island is home to a breathtaking array of flora and fauna, such as the Sika deer, as well as the red-bottomed macaque. 
the old growth forests have become world famous with some trees over 2,300 years old. Surely a place this special is worth protecting. We set out on our adventure to Yakushima to see what steps the farmers were taking to preserve this precious island. We knew they produced great tea, but we wanted to see how it was produced. The boat ride was quite long, but we found ways to pass the time. Hi everybody. This is all over from you. Shortly after arriving in Yakushima, we rented a car and headed out on our way. You like the color? I love the color. With the farmer visit scheduled for tomorrow, we had a full day to explore the natural beauty of this island. We got a chance to visit Yakushima National Park and hiked through the magical forest that inspired Hayao Miyazaki's famous anime movie, Princess Mononoke. Here you could find old, moss-covered trees with large roots stretching all throughout the forest. There were also beautiful streams with crystal clear blue water. Later that day, we decided to take a sunset cruise around the island and really take in all of the sights. We ended up heading far out onto a peninsula and stumbled upon a hidden gem. This Tory gate marks the transition from the mundane to the sacred and is often placed at the entrance to a Shinto shrine. In this case, it marked the entrance to a cave shrine carved out into the rocky cliff. The shrine inside the cave was a quiet respite from the crashing waves of the outside. As the sun began to set, we took a little walk along the beach and enjoyed the last few moments of daylight. In the morning, we would be meeting with the farmers of Hachimanju and learning so much about their world. One of the coolest things about this farm was that it was in the middle of a beautiful pine forest. The farmer proudly told us that no other activity occurred on this land before the cultivation of organic tea. There are no other chemicals in the soil and the nutrients have not been depleted. The farmer also told us that they return the nutrients to the soil every year through a process that is unique to their field. Just as with any other plant, tea plants absorb the nutrients from the soil and pass them on to other parts of the plant. Tea gets its flavor from the nutrients in the soil and therefore these nutrient dense soils produce some delicious teas. But what we heard from the farmer is that they also like to give back to the soil. Just like with Mr. Sakamoto, Mr. Watanabe also said that while most farmers only take from the soil, they like to give back. The last tea harvest of the year, Akibancha, is sold by most farmers as its own type of tea. The farmers at Hachimanju actually take these leaves, turn them into a mulch, and then return them to the soil. This way, they are returning the nutrients to the soil and ensuring that they are not taking too much. This outlook is pretty common on the island of Yakushima. While the tea industry in Japan is only 2% organic, the organic farmers of Yakushima account for 15% of the total production of tea. Mr. Watanabe explained that this could partially be due to the climate. One of the hardest parts about organic farming is dealing with insects. There are many different types of insects that bite the tea leaves, and without conventional pesticides, it is difficult to keep them away. Luckily, insects aren't much of a problem for the farmers of Yakushima. Yakushima has the highest annual rainfall in Japan and is one of the wettest places on Earth. The annual rainfall in Yakushima can be as high as 390 inches a year, compared to just 60 inches in Tokyo. The locals here claim that in Yakushima, it rains 35 days a month. This rainfall helps deter a lot of bugs without harming the tea crop. The climate is also unique for another reason. Although it is a southern island, Yakushima is actually quite cold. The high mountains create unique weather patterns that actually allow the tea to rest for a longer period of the year. Tea plants normally absorb nutrients from the soil between late fall and early spring before they begin to produce fresh leaves. On Yakushima, the buds take a little bit longer and therefore the tea is able to absorb more nutrients over a longer period of time. This gives more character to the tea. When it comes to flavor, the farmer, Mr. Watanabe, wants the tea to taste natural. 
He explains that while adding a lot of fertilizer to the soil would produce a very strong flavor, he doesn't believe that, that is how the tea is intended to taste. It is amazing to see his commitment to natural farming. Not only does he want to make tea in a natural way, he wants the flavor to be natural as well. The end result are teas that taste fresher and milder without this strong umami or sweetness or bitterness to them. We arrive just in time to see another important part of the tea farming process. A few days before the harvest, some tea plants are shaded in black nylon netting called kabuse. This cuts off the sunlight and forces the plant to undergo a chemical change. During this process, the tea plant produces more theanine and less catechins. The theanine is the amino acid in the plant responsible for its sweet umami flavor. It is also the part of the plant that gives you the famous calm alertness when you drink it. But this doesn't just affect the taste of the tea, it also impacts the color. The tea plant also produces more chlorophyll, which is the compound that gives plants their green color. You can see this color change very clearly if there is a hole in the netting. The plants exposed to the sunlight are much lighter than those that are not exposed to the light. This shading process softens the tea, reducing the bitter catechins and increasing the sweeter theanine of the plant. Even the tea plants that were not meant to be shaded are partially cut off from the sunlight due to the high trees from the surrounding forest. This creates a very unique taste for the teas of Hachimanju. After touring the fields, we decided to do a quick tasting of some of the teas. We currently sell four teas from these farmers, the Shincha, Sencha, Genmaicha, and Kukicha, but we wanted to see if there were any more we could start supplying. We were particularly interested in seeing if they had a hojicha that would meet our high standards. It's incredibly sweet. A little bit of a cereally. A lot of flour, I said. Not like oolong flour, but rather <laughs> like spring flowers. Very interesting. So let's go for the tasting. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a very sweet dojicha. There's not a lot of this roasty flavor, of, uh, of uh, roasted flavor, chocolate, but it's very sweet and soft, and there's a lot of uh, cereal flavor. After tasting a few teas, we took a drive into the forest of Yakushima to meet another iconic resident of the island. Masayuki Yamashita is a famous Japanese potter who moved into the countryside of Yakushima so he could work on pottery in the more traditional style. He uses a large kiln and burns wood from the nearby forest in order to produce a beautiful ash glaze. All of his pottery is made from completely natural ingredients. He even goes to the beach to collect corals and sands to produce additional vibrant colors for his pottery. Some of his designs are simple and some are very intricate. Yakushima is a small island, but it has a lot to teach. By the end of our three-day trip, we had met so many interesting people and learned so many things about tea cultivation. It was really cool how this unique climate shaped the lives of the people who inhabited it. We would soon be headed back to Tokyo, but we would be taking with us a ton of amazing stories. In the final chapter of our quest for tea, we head to Shizuoka, the largest tea growing region in Japan. It is here that family tea farms have turned into full-scale businesses in just a few short generations. We explore the innovative methods these farmers use to compete in the tea industry. We also take a broader look at the modern tea industry and what we believe the next generation of tea farmers will look like. So, hi everyone. We are now back on our way. Uh, before our day, going finally to Shizuoka. We had tonight a meeting, a business meeting, um, to organize also the shipments out of Japan. And uh, tomorrow we will go to uh, Shizuoka finally to meet uh, two farmers tomorrow and one farmer the day after. 
tomorrow will be mainly a day about matches so I'm really looking forward to this and then on the next day we're gonna meet a farmer which we haven't met yet and haven't tasted the, their teas but they are sourcing us or can source us with a lovely shincha so we're gonna check that out the day after. If you have never seen it, you have seen it now. So here we are in the mountain field of um, the farm of Sada. And uh, what is particular here, what you can see as well, is um, when we were at Mr. Sakamoto or also in Yakushima, we had a lot of earth and uh, crops mixed with earth but here uh, the ground is really stony so you really can see that this is a mountain plantation mountain hill plantation a lot of stones meaning also a lot of minerals going into um, into the earth into the ground but it's uh, just a different way how also to nourish the ground um, especially for this area here which is higher up in the mountain Although the company Osada is quite large, they still source their tea on a smaller scale. Rather than having huge plots of land like some other tea companies, they rely on small family farms. One group of farms in particular they refer to as the Organic Village. This region, known in Japan as Isagawa, is a collection of several small farms that produce tea completely pesticide-free. With all the surrounding farms being organic, the farmers here don't need to worry about cross-contamination when it comes to pesticides and chemicals. With the tea produced at such a small scale, the farmers are able to really focus on quality. The farmers can also easily source organic tea, which is crucial for businesses that sell internationally. While only about 7% of the Japanese green tea market is organic, almost a quarter of the tea sent internationally is organic, and that figure is growing. With the demand for organic products in Europe and the U.S. increasing, dynamic companies like Osada are ready to capitalize on it. They told us that they are beginning to shift their resources more into the production of organic tea. The Osada company also sells their tea to other businesses. Because it is more profitable for a business to specialize in one area, many tea companies buy an unfinished tea product called aracha and process it into their own unique varieties. In other words, some companies simply buy their tea instead of growing it. Osada is more than happy to produce aracha for other companies, so they built this new production facility up in the mountains. This is just another way that Osada uses its advantages to compete in a competitive industry. They also showed us a few methods of farming that we hadn't yet seen before. These kabuse nets have been interwoven with white nylon to protect them from the sun. Normally the kabuse nets are made exclusively with black nylon, which can attract more of the sun's rays. The farmer believes that this will help keep the plant cooler so that it will not be damaged by intense heat during the shading process. This is a small example of how there is still room for innovation in the centuries-old tea industry. So we're here in the production facility of uh, Mr. Sada, so the machines are just uh, cleaned in the next weeks to be ready for the harvest. But what uh, he just told us is what's pretty impressive is that he has a carnadicha um, where he, they first ferment it, ferment it a little bit, so it's slightly fermented, and then they go in the production process of the oven of the carnadicha, so this slight roasting, and they do this slight fermentation just before the roasting to enhance the flavor and also the smell of the tea. Seeing businesses like Osada makes you think that all is well in the tea industry, but many tea farmers are struggling in the modern age. The biggest issue, many of them say, is the change in culture with the younger generations. Many young people in Japan have traded in their teapots for coffee makers, and if they do drink tea, more often than not, it is the type that comes in plastic bottles. Furthermore, it is difficult for tea farmers to pass on their family businesses to their children. With the younger generation moving east to Tokyo, the average age of the tea farmer is increasing with each passing year. One group of farmers wants to change this. Meet Matcha Organic Japan. 
This group of young farmers got together and bought a few plots of land in their town so that the older tea farmers could retire with their fields in capable hands. This group is ready to carry the torch and ensure that tea farming continues to be a part of the Japanese identity. After observing the trends in the tea industry, they decided to focus exclusively on organic production. They also believe that matcha has the most potential with the next generation, so they began specializing in the production of this powdered tea. They are starting to experiment with different cultivars and really had some amazing blends for us to try. Good, so we are here in um, the organic green tea fields from uh, Organic Matcha Japan and this is actually a beautiful project. It is a collaboration of five young farmers which uh, col collaborate uh, together to uh, do these fields. So we are totally um, talking about 10 hectares which will be used by next year, 6 hectares at the moment and they are renting these hectares for elderly people who were not able to do these fields anymore. But the um, green tea market in Japan is at the moment changing a lot as the younger generation doesn't really want to um, do or drink green tea anymore, especially in the more um, old or uh, traditional way. So they are changing a lot for coffee, so coffee at the moment in the younger generation is a lot growing at the moment. But on the other side, we have in Europe and North America a growing demand for matcha, we have a growing demand for organic Japanese green tea. So originally tea fields which are non-organic continue or start to transform or being transformed by projects like these to organic tea fields and then will be brought out to the world. So finally the demand of uh, or, uh, green tea is uh, stabilized by the demand uh, for foreign countries, but there is a switch from non-organic to organic, which we personally think is pretty cool. Everything has to be automated. We are here in Shizuoka city. It's actually pretty warm and uh, well, it has been a great day. We left uh, the bed this morning at 5.20, 5.50 And we're here now at 7.21, finishing our day. A lot of things we saw, and I have nothing more to say. Peace work, love you. The next morning, we visited the tea company Marufuku, one of the pioneers of organic green tea in Shizuoka. The current owner, Mr. Bunji Ito has his daughters running the tea business and that is who we got to meet when we arrived in the office. It was great to see business women in leadership roles that were previously occupied by men just one generation ago, yet another sign that change is coming to this very traditional industry. We were able to taste an incredible cold brew hojicha that they had prepared. This was perhaps the best hojicha we had experienced on the trip and the fact that it was cold made it even better. By using cold water, the tea becomes sweeter and less bitter, while still containing plenty of flavor. <laughs> so what you can see is that the, actually the area around of, uh, around of Shizuoka um, has the Abe River, and the Abe River brings a lot of humidity uh, into the area. And the Hirano, this is now the tea where we are tasting the tea from. Um, as the fields are very close to the Abe River, the, it brings a lot of humidity and then says, gives a strong taste to the tea. What I realized now by tasting it is that uh, in terms of strong taste it gives a lot of freshness to the tea, but not too much of this typical umami note. Um, and uh, what's, uh, what's also important here that it is more is a mountain side, so the mountains also uh, give a lot of minerals to the soil, which then finally nourish the plant um, uh, quite strongly. That's what this region is known for. After a short tasting, we decided to tour the factory where they produce the tea. <laughs> Good. Ready for the factory. Because this tea factory was in the middle of a city, it occupied multiple floors. While this may seem inconvenient, the workers here used the layout to their advantage. The tea leaves start out at the top and then gravity pulls them down as they go through different stages in the production process. 
Here you can see the stems and leaves being separated from the tea plant. The stems will go on to be used in a kukicha, or stem tea, while the leaves will be used for the regular sencha. Later on, the leaves will move to the lower floor of the tea factory for the final stages of the production. So we are here now in the basement of the Mount Fuku um, production site. And um, what you can see here is a huge blending machine. So in this blending machine, up to 4,000 kilograms of tea is mixed together coming uh, from upstairs, so upstairs they are sorting off the tea and then bringing it into these huge blending machines. Then the tea is blended and um, what is important as the sign that you can, you can see up here, there is a magnetic uh, sign so actually the particles or there can be some uh, metal particles in the tea leaves due to the cutting with the machines on the fields so these ones are taken out and there's even a part which takes out uh, aluminium uh, the aluminium particles so finally the tea is clean and proper and finally it gets here in these boxes um, over here so this is uh, Typical tea box, very beautiful made uh, to keep the tea fresh, and then it is put into the cooler. After visiting seven different tea farms, we really learned a lot about the tea industry as a whole. Not only did we learn about how much goes into making tea, but also how much goes into being a tea farmer. These farmers have their own aspirations, their own obstacles, and their own visions for the future. After all the effort that goes into producing green tea, the least we can do is put some effort into choosing it. Finding the best quality tea doesn't have to be difficult, but it can be rewarding. By supporting small organic family farms, not only are you getting the best quality product, but you are also helping ensure that there is a bright future for this incredible industry. By bringing us into their lives, these farmers have given us such an incredible gift. To give back, we want to share their stories, their passions, and most importantly, their tea with all of you. If you are interested in joining our quest to find the best organic tea in Japan, please check out neoteas.com for more info. Together, we believe that we can make a difference by doing things the right way.